Welcome into the K0LWC Ham Shack. Tonight, have something very cool to share with you. Now, if you're like me and like a good tropo opening, you probably played pretty close attention to the VHF propagation map. This map has been on the internet for a long, long time, maybe as close to 20 years. Did you know that, that map was actually created by a ham right here in Minnesota? His name is John Harder NG0E. Now, I learned that John has a new project up his sleeve that does not just involve visualizing VHF propagation, but it also visualizes HF propagation. Now, this is a game changer. I love a good map. I love a good visualization. And that is what John is bringing to the table. So I had to have John on the channel to talk about this new project, what it's all about, and how you can support his amazing work. So let's get over and talk to John. All right, I'm so excited to welcome in John Harder, NG0E. Thanks so much for taking the time uh, to chat, John. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's good to be here. So, John, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ham radio operators that have used your tools for a very long time. I know I'm one of them. Um, it started with doing VHF propagation visualization. Just to walk us through how you ended up deciding to go that route with that project. How did you get into this? Well, um, I was getting into some of the VHF uh, DXing or, you know, sideband CW. And I, I saw that the uh, tools I had online to report contacts. And I looked at, looked at that and I said, wow, I can, I could actually automate that and, and uh, report contacts online uh, from APRS and just like a robot, uh, put contacts in, into their, into the bulletin boards or whatever they called them in those days. And uh, that would have been a bad idea, but it, <laughs> it got me thinking, no, let's just put this on a map. There's, there's got to be a way to map it. So that's kind of how I got started. And uh, the original maps were, were static maps. You would either choose North America or Europe or whatever continent. And you were, you were stuck with, with uh, that map at that size. And it, uh, sometime later, I moved it to Google Maps, and then when Google started wanting money for uh, because it was so popular, then I moved it into the the open uh, they call it open layers of so like the open street maps. Yeah, and we're looking at that here, and I know that so many people use this because it's really great for looking for sporadic E and tropo, you know, and that's what's such a wonderful tool for. Mm -hmm. And this is using APRS data. That's really what drives this map, right? Yes, that is that is all the data that's used there. It's all from APRS. And how did you get into this? Like, what's your background that led you to do working on cool projects like this? Well, I I uh, have a degree in computer science, from, a master's degree from the University of Minnesota, and worked in the Twin Cities uh, in uh, client server Unix environments for almost 20 years. So it's kind of my go-to. I, I just uh, have been coding for a very long time and really enjoy it. And it's, it's one of those things I can keep coming back to. I don't get tired of doing it. And then, I mean, the VHF map has been around a very long time. Um, like you said, maybe as much as like between 15 or 20 years. It's been out there for a while and it's been a great tool for a long time. How old is this newest project for you, which is moving from you know VHF and APRS data into mapping and visualizing HF propagation? When did that come out? Well, I've been playing with some ideas on on it uh, with it for maybe over a year, and um, I'm ng0e on Twitter, and so several months ago, I just showed uh, people on Twitter the different different ways that you could do it uh, and um, they were they didn't look anything at all like the present maps but they were, they they showed different th different kinds of data i could pull out and i said each of these have a problem and and i don't like it but this this shows the concept that you can do something interesting on hf and so then a, a you know, in the past couple of months, I just really doubled down and and got the this current map put together. 
which um, it was kind of based on the VHF one, but just about everything had to be rewritten because it's such a different kind of beast to work with. And to that point, what data sources are you pulling in to visually create this map? What data is powering this? So I, I'm looking at the pulling in the f kind of four different sources. One is um, a DX cluster, and then there's the Whisper network, which that actually has a lot of data and is probably probably half of the data that's on here. And then RBN, which is CW and FT8, F FT4, which is also a lot of data. And uh, yeah, which one is left? Oh, PSK Reporter, which is um, PSK, well, not so much PSK these days, but CW and Teletype and, and some of those other digital modes. And when somebody that's new comes into this tool, and we're looking at it here on the screen, the first thing that'll probably pop up is the maximum usable frequency or MUF. How does someone utilize the MUF tab, if you will, on this tool um, so that way they can make it you know, functional for them and, and read it? How do they do that? Right, so, so the way it starts out, it, show, it kind of shows worldwide in any area what the, the MUF is. And, and for this map, I call it the maximum used frequency because it's based on real-time data, not, not theoretical data. Which, which, you know, that initial view isn't that helpful for an individual. So what you have to do is find your location and click on it. And once you've done that and you get the little black star at your location, then it shows you um, the maximum frequency that is being received or, or being heard from your location. So like in the map now, if you want to talk to China, that looks like the color for maybe uh, 21 megahertz. Let's have a look, see. Whoops, I moved my arrow. I think that was the problem. There we go. Yep, this looks like it's 15 meters. Yeah, and if you mouse over, it will also tell you. Oh, you know, this is a little glitch with the open... Uh, the open maps, you have to go, you have to scroll it all the way so that kind of the the, uh, the uh, Greenwich uh, mean is in the uh, in the middle of the map. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, so you've got to, if you will zoom way out. Yeah, so if you go to your right, then then the uh, Asia will will show up. So they don't. So the open layer maps don't um, wrap that around. You have to be kind of, you have to be on kind of the 360 degrees that's centered on London or however you would put that. Sure. So I clicked in my star here in, in the Twin Cities of Minnesota and echo November 34, as it were. And so as I look at this and I highlight it, of course, we're now under 21 megahertz up on the top there. So what this is telling me that, you know, I have the opportunity potentially to work in Japan or eastern parts of China on 15 meters using, in this case, it's telling mm -hmm. me digital. Mm -hmm. And how is that discerning between, I know you have phone, CW, and digital. So how are right. you making those judgments in the data to display the proper outline on the map? So it, the real obvious one is if it's a if it's a sideband report from DX cluster, or if it's a CW report from RBN, then you know that supports CW. But if it's um, from the Whisper network, they give signal to noise ratio data, and so if you know that the SNR is greater than ten, then then you can. Um, you can assume that then sideband would be supported, even though I'm not necessarily looking at data that was actually a sideband signal. The signal to noise ratio is high enough that sideband should be supported. Sure. And that's so, what I think is so useful is that you have them distinctly identified, right? Like you're 
you're not saying is that 15 meters is is all open because like, you're right. It comes down to that signal to noise ratio, right? Where mm-hmm. you know it may be able to support FT8, but not quite enough propagation to support phone. Right, right. The the other thing um, that's that's nice about the whisper network, they tell you how much power a station is working or is using. So like I often put mine on at a at a tenth of a watt. And if somebody is picking me up at a tenth of a watt at a certain SNR, I'm what I say as well, if somebody's using sideband, they're probably using at least a hundred watts. So I can multiply that by by a thousand and say, wow, that is, if it's coming that, this strong on a very weak signal, if, if you have a signal that's a thousand times that power, then you've got a really, really good signal and I can just call it. That's, that's a sideband level signal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, how do you feel right now with where this tool is at. I know you said like, this is different than VHF. It's there's a little bit more, you know, like tricky things to think through of how to get this to display correctly. I mean, where is it at right now? Do you feel in terms of its reliability and polish? And then where do you think you're going to take it from where it's at now? And then in the future? Well, I think it's kind of in the model T days right now. Um, There's, there's just a lot of work to do on it. So like, at some point, I'm going to going to really put my station on Whisper and try to figure out, well, I'm, I'm seeing these kind of stations coming up or, or these stations in Paraguay or whatever are reporting me. Why doesn't that show up on the map? What's, you know, what's broken about that? And I, I'm, just ex- I'm just expecting that I'm going to have to kind of dig into things like that, where it seems like it should be showing something, but that I'm actually doing, but I'm not seeing it. I want to know why. And is there, you know, something that other folks can do that the ham radio community can do to help? I know one of those things, of course, being someone that has web projects that are, are public facing the internet, of course, is financial support, right? Because servers aren't free um, and your tools are very, very popular. So there's a cost associated with that. But are there other things in addition to donating financial support to keep these awesome things running and online? Are there other things that hams can do that maybe would help you out in this project? Just curious. Well, I think the best thing um, hams can do is to get stations on the air that are reporting. So set up a whisper station, um, a PSK reporter, RBN, set all that up, especially in areas where there's holes on the map. Um, the, uh, you know, that vast Western U.S. Yeah, see, there's a hole right there where there's nothing uh showing up well that's probably just because of uh the band but often you know often there's uh, just gaps in the data and that's that's helpful to everyone yeah, i was gonna say so like even here on 40 meters which i think would be yeah it's it's yeah it's kind of probably sunset right now but we kind of see that same hole on this band here on 40 as well so maybe not as many stations up in that kind of northwest mm-hmm. corner and that's mm-hmm. the thing also that like Oftentimes, uh, FT8 or other digital modes are considered controversial by some and that, you know, people don't like them. People love them. Mm-hmm. There's, it's like a real even split of like either you like it or you don't. And I think this is a great example of a real world case of where the data that's created by running these digital modes and digital networks and protocols. I mean, it really does help and have real world application. Yeah, and it's it's so easy to um, to set up a station and just have it receive. You don't even have to transmit. You you set it on um, you set it on Whisper or PSK Reporter, and just have it report everything it's heard. And your station will be contributing data if you do that. Uh, of course, you have to have a a network connection to be reporting that back. Um, so yeah. Uh, I, that's what I encourage people to do: play around with some of those modes and and start reporting. And do you have a sense on like your VHF tool, the APRS um, backed tool, 
of how many people utilize that tool. I know you don't have like account registration. I'm sure you could probably tell overall bandwidth in a given you know month, year, day, et cetera. But do you have a sense of how many people use that on a, a daily, monthly, or a yearly basis? Yeah, I haven't looked at that data, and that's something I want to add as kind of a counter and and see see what's going going on as far as as users. But I did uh, with this new uh, with this new project. I've been kind of keeping an eye on that and just getting an idea of IP addresses. And that's um, when it was when the it was first kind of announced. Uh, what was that? A week and a half ago on Twitter. When when people really it really peaked out after that announcement, there was about 400 unique uh, IP addresses per hour, and that and some of those could be multiple users. Like if it's some ISP that has the same address, we don't know how many users are behind that. Uh, but since then, it's kind of settled down a little bit to 100 to 150 an hour, and maybe it'll go up again over the weekend if depending on people's operating practice but yeah it uh but just uh talking about the cost the uh the bandwidth to europe really spiked so europeans are are much more interested in this than they ever have been on the the vhf all right. Well, thanks so much for, for joining, John, talking about this project. If people have follow up questions, maybe want to, I said, ask you, uh, for, you know, pick your brain, collaboration, whatever it might be. How can they get in touch with you? Um, the best way is uh, on the website under contact. It shows some social media uh my social media contacts, that's that's really the very best way because I noticed those. So um, Mastodon, I'm using quite a bit now. Um, Twitter, there's still a lot of people on Twitter. So um, you can contact me that way also. All right, perfect. Well, thanks so much, John, again, for your time to come talk about this great project. And thanks for all the work that you do uh, for the amateur radio community. I know I greatly appreciate it. I know there are tons of others that do because what you're creating, as you said, really is valuable and useful to the entire community. So I just want to say thank you so much for your hard work. Yeah, you're welcome. Good to chat with you today.